<laughs> Guys, we're talking about arrows today and hunting. This is straight off the quiver. Uh, I am in bear hunting mode. So I'm in turkey hunting mode. Turkeys, but I am because this is my turkey setup. Go hence go. the lighted knock. This is an FMJ. Uh, it looks like an old school Easton, what, 0075? Uh, XX75 camo. XX75 camo. Yeah, that's what this was. They this were very throwback. popular. Uh, and I Limited love that because that's what I started with. So yeah. when they, I think they, I don't think they run these anymore. But no, I, had, I don't. I don't think they do. I bought like all of them when it came <laughs> out. So I have a lot of these. But this is uh, what's the GPI on these? Eleven. They're heavy. They're, I thought they were high tens if I remember right. It's not 11, published three. on that, is it? Eleven three drains right. per inch. Heavy. Real heavy. Yeah. Um, and then I put even more weight up front. I take a brass Easton insert. I take this down break, off. break it off to 50 Sierra 50 and then this mm -hmm. is a hundred grain four blade so in the back end here so josh isn't a big fan of wraps i'm not either a lot of times i'll take the wrap and i'll just cut it short because most wraps will kick out to here i'll cut it short i could even cut it in the back but i just it helps get the veins to stick with these yeah you do run into that issue with any of these aluminum exteriors because the materials very very fine the holes in it are fine so it's hard for the adhesion to stick to it whereas carbon is a little more porous on the exterior so yeah. your resins or your glues will actually impregnate farther into there yeah. so you it's very common to see a wrap on an aluminum exterior because it does help it stick back end here so oh, blazers two inch three degree offset uh, and then your lighted knock so this is a is it knockout contender uh, yeah it's a knockout I do like these, I think they're, where do guys start when they're building their arrows? Where do you like them to start? Well, a lot of it has to do with what you're hunting. Like when you're hunting bears, this is like ridiculously excessive. Yeah. Because a bear has thin skin. Very. It's a very soft material, so it doesn't take a lot of force to cut. So the four blade where you're gonna take a little bit more resistance on your cut, not a big deal on bear. Start going up to elk, I wanna think twice a little bit about what you're trying to cut with. This is really more of an, elk hunting setup in my opinion yeah because you are pretty excessive tip. on weight and most times when you're hunting bears you're hunting bears at you know 20 yards you're usually hunting over bait or that kind of scenario to where they're close there's a lot of different ways you can hunt bears but you're usually getting pretty close because they're even eyesight. on spot and stock yeah the furthest i've ever shot a bear would be like 50. it's yeah. not my preference i'd say like 30 and in on spot and stock bears yeah their eyesight sucks so if you can get down winds and and move quietly it's not that hard to get close to them so the velocity of your arrow becomes a little more relevant because you are close. So they hear the shot go off a little more. And they can hear well. Definitely. And they can smell really well. They just can't see. I mean, they can, yeah. but you can get away with a lot on the visual. So Just velocity, motion is kind of what they pick up. So if you're yeah. slow. Yeah. Velocity would be a little bit more of a plus when it comes to hunting bears. You're, so you're going to penetrate. So I a lighter arrow for sure. Oh, for sure. But yeah. uh, I like a little heavier. I'm shorter draw length. I bump my limbs up to 80. Well, and there's reasons for it, but yeah. when it comes to bear, it's not near as relevant. Same thing with like white-tailed deer. It's thin skin, smaller chest cavity. You know, if you're shooting a decent amount of poundage, you really don't need the heavy. Heavy is for bigger animals. Okay. Thicker hide. I mean, there's elk that have in thick hide. You're cutting through a lot of hide before you get through there. And that's what really slows the arrow down more than anything is getting through that hide, which has a lot to do with the type of tip that's on your broadhead. Yeah. Really sharp. You get stuff that's blunted or not, like if you touch it with your finger, it doesn't feel like it's going to cut you. That's going to take a lot more force to get through the hide before the blades can start doing their job. If you're running a blade all the way to the front, it's not relevant at that well, point. Well, let's talk elk hunting. I think a lot of people are white tail hunters. Obviously, that's the mm -hmm. majority of our uh, pastime or sport, whatever you want to call it, bow hunting. But let's talk about the guys going out west for elk mm -hmm. specifically. They do have a thick hide. Where do you start with selecting an arrow? Well, an arrow, definitely good FOC or forward of center percentage to me is a, is a priority. It's always important to have that good weight front because it tends to penetrate better and it moves less in the wind. And the wind does tend to blow out here. So that's really, really, really important. Um, overall physical weight is always a plus. If you go heavy, you're going to penetrate. You're not going to typically have the kind of issues that people run into that are using really light setups. But I find there's a good happy medium. This, this to me is a little excessive unless you have a short draw length yeah then or you've experienced a penetration issue and then you're just you know yeah. nervous about it so you tend to gravitate a little bit more towards the heavy but as long as you're running above 12 13 percent foc i think that's really the big important thing and your arrow is strong enough structurally to take 
an impact. So, i.e., you glance off something and it doesn't snap in half. Or you brush it up against something and what it doesn't break. What app and there's... do you have on your phone to check FOC? Well, I'm an Android guy. I'm not an Apple guy. Okay. And there's all kinds of free apps for that kind of stuff. I have Aero Velocity apps. I have FOC apps. I have Ballistic Chart apps. They're all free. I just... I'm going to put some of those up on yeah. the video right now. You can check those out. Yeah. And I know um, Archer's Advantage is a hugely popular tool. Yeah. It's more popular in the target community, but it has kinetic energy, FOC, arrow chart. So you put in all your information and it'll tell you what arrow spine you should be using. It has like every arrow in there. So you can go through different brands and different types and it'll tell you relative of what you should be using. Um, it'll do a ballistic sight tape for you. So if you use a movable sight and want a projection ballistic, you can actually print off of it. Yeah. They're like, it's like 20 bucks to buy it somewhere around that vicinity. But if you're doing longer distance stuff, yeah, that's really, really relevant. It'll have more information than you will possibly ever use and you can just totally geek out on the available information in that app. That's Archer's Advantage. Uh, they have an online version and then they have like a, a desktop version that you can like save to your computer and never have to build be all online your tapes, to use it and build everything. all your tapes, print off stuff. Uh, and you can really manipulate the stuff. I mean, they're taking your peep height, your peep length, your overall velocity, your fletching type, tip weight, FOC weight. I mean, there's, there's so much in there to really give you accurate information. So, and then you obviously want to go check it and make sure it's right. And then you can put in default adjusters to change it a little bit. So if you get out there to 90 yards and you go out and shoot your 90 yard and it's just not quite right, you can actually go in and set a default on it and it'll reprint you a tape that that works correctly. Legit. Out. Yeah, it's pretty cool. All right, so we got 11.3 on the heavier spectrum. What would be like something in the nine or 10 GPI grain per inch? What is that medium? Um, nine to ten is probably medium. That's that's a really what's kind of like considered light. Is that that seven? Six, seven. Yeah, anything below seven is just really fragile. Um, the lightest stuff I've personally used is seven, and I've had multiple arrows break after I shot something with it, as it was like running away, it snapped it off. But I've seen some really heavy stuff do that too. But I typically haven't had any glance off my arrow snap in the process. Yeah. So sevens really as light as I would ever okay. recommend, and I would consider that like extremely light on the GPI. All right, so we have our ranges. Now, here's my next question. Is there an inverse relationship between GPI and spine? Like the heavier arrow, the spine number goes like, so if I'm shooting 10 GPI, yeah. should I shoot a 400 spine? If I'm no. shooting 11, should I shoot a 340? No, spine What's, is spine. Spine, spine is, spine is spine regardless of what it weighs. Based on draw weight. It's based on draw weight, tip weight, and you know those variables and how long the arrow's cut at. So spine is spine no matter what. It doesn't matter if that arrow weighed seven grains an inch or 12 grains an inch, it's still 300 spine, 300 spine. Go off it's the, the same back of the box of the arrows? Is that? Uh, well, it depends on the brand of how to determine what the spine is. A lot of manufacturers will use the actual spine number as their call sign for the arrow. Like these are 340. 340s. So that is actually the spine stiffness or deflection. Right. And spine is measured by a shaft suspended over, depending on who's going off of it, some go off of 28 inches, some go off of 30 inches, a given amount of weight in the middle to measure how far it deflects from center. And that's the spine of the arrow or the deflection. And the lower the, the number lower is the number, the stiffer the arrow, right. higher the number, the weaker the arrow. Some manufacturers don't use that as their number on the side of the arrow. Like um, Easton pretty much does. Victory pretty much does. Gold tip mostly is now. They used to not. They used to give it up like 55, 75, 75, 95. Um, Carbon Express, I don't believe, is using the deflection huh. as their number. But if you go to their website or their look up in their catalog, you can the number it. on it will relate to a deflection and it will post what that deflection is. Based on so you can, what you're shooting. You can, it's like, well, this is French and this is English. I went to a, you know, figure out what this means in English and here you go. Yeah. So yeah, it says 250 over here. It means 400 in you know my language. So the taller, longer you are, like, so my wife's sp spined arrow, she's shorter than me, shorter mm -hmm. draw length, mm -hmm. it's in the 500s. Mm -hmm. I'm 340s for East. And you being what, 30 inch draw? Would yeah. Be like more like what, two? I'm usually using a 300. A 300? Because um, I tend to cut my arrows down as much as possible. By making your arrow shorter, you're making your arrow stiffer, stiffer and increasing the forward to center percentage. That's cool. For every inch you cut off the arrow in the front, you're adding like two thirds to three quarters of a percent FOC. Oh. Everything else being exactly the same. Insert weight the same, tip weight the same, fletching the same, cut this arrow down an inch, it's three quarters of a percent higher FOC. So percentage. let me ask you this, on a bow like mine, what's the shortest you could cut comfortably 
off the rest when it's up to where you're like, okay. When you have a containment system like this where you really don't ever have to worry about your arrow coming out and you're know, resting on your hand or that type of system, personally, I would go a half of an inch in front of the launcher when you're at draw. So pull your bow back, have somebody take like a Sharpie and mark your arrow where it lines up with the launcher yeah. and go a half inch in front of that for safety. Okay. And then from there, I would usually tell somebody to go up to the nearest half of an inch mark in a measurement so you don't have a funky cut length. Yeah. So you're not like, my arrow length is 27 and 15 sixteenths. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Just go, 27, just go 28. Yeah. You know, so you can at least remember it. But yeah, by cutting the arrow down, you make a stiffer arrow. So I tend to run, I have a 30 inch draw length and I run about 28 inch arrows. And okay. that usually gives me about a half inch in front of my launcher. And I'm 26 inch arrows-ish yeah. and I'm 27 inch draw. Yeah, well, you, you could probably get away with a little shorter if yeah. you wanted, which would increase your FOC yep. and make a stiffer arrow, allowing you to you not have to go to a mega stiff arrow with all this extra weight you have in the front. Because the more weight you put in the front, the stiffer your arrow has to be to bend the same way when you fire. Makes sense. Let's talk about fletching then. Uh, there's a lot of straight, three degree, helical, like, I know you like your arrows to spin. Mm -hmm. Um, What do you think, what's the general rule of thumb? Well, I believe personally, once this arrow gets turning, it doesn't take more force to keep it turning. So I don't believe it's gonna drop by more downrange. And in most of my testing that I've played with over time, as long as we're talking the same weight sort of set up in the same profile of fletch, they tend to still shoot the same. They don't drop heavier downrange. I mean, it drops a little more, but it's a pretty insignificant amount for the tightness of group that I get by having a really hard helical. So I put as much twist on my fletch as possible really? and then try to profile back the size of the vein. Because when you're looking down the arrow like that, what you see visually is what the wind sees as it goes. Yeah. So the more twist you can put on it, the more it's gonna cause your arrow to turn at a quicker ratio. So two inch blazers, where would you classify that as low profile? Um, I would consider this on the shorter side of stuff, but okay. it's still there. What tends to be really popular anymore is anything between two inch and three inch. You are seeing inch and three quarters playing a role. I would only put that on a mechanical. I would be really hesitant to shoot a fixed blade broadhead with anything smaller than this. Okay. Um, I personally like a 2.6 because the profile is a little lower. So you get a little more clearance as your arrow's leaving the bow from clearing your cables, clearing your arrow rest, clearing any other abrasion as it goes down range. Um, and you still get a really good twist. You actually can put a little more twist on it so it makes it spin a little faster and a little lower profile so you're trimming some of the weight of that longer vein that isn't gonna end up weighing more. So that's my preference, but two inch blazers fly really good on a good helical. And it's well, a slight offset straight, not so much, but. Let's talk these then. Okay. So this is the contender. I believe I weighed it was 20 grains mm -hmm. for the whole deal versus my regular knock that comes stock that I think is like eight or nine, eight, yeah. eight grains. Usually. So I just kind of decreased my front of center by adding weight to the back, right? Yeah, for every like five you put back here, you gotta add like 25 up here to achieve the same percentage, which is why I'm not a big fan Don't of wraps. Don't think about that, yeah. Yeah, because uh, I love how a wrap looks. I love how the veins stick. I added seven grains to the back of my arrow Offsetting that, I need to put 35 up here to have the same FOC percentage. Yeah. That's a lot of extra front weight. Yeah. So to me, I like the lighted knock where it's legal to use because it's so much easier to see. Like it's drastically easier. It makes you more ethical in my opinion. It does, it but, does. But you're adding another 10 to 20 grains over a regular knock depending on the configuration and what you're using. Okay. Um, so to me, the visual is worth the offset which is why I typically run about a 60 grain insert up here okay. and a lighted knock back here. And my complete arrows, I think 14%. That's awesome. If I remember right, which okay. is a lot of FOC. And I still don't have a really heavy projectile. I'm still around 400 grains. So I've used the Contender mm -hmm. uh, just this year, but mm -hmm. I've never, uh, I shot a Cougar. No, I didn't. I had to use, I couldn't use lighted knocks in Idaho. Idaho, yeah. get it figured out. So I haven't shot a contender through an animal, yeah. but I have used nocturnals. Mm -hmm. And I really like those because they, uh, you can twist, no problem twist the knock mm -hmm. if you're messing with, you know, trying to get a broadhead set up perfect and you're indexing. But with these, you cannot twist, you'll break them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all I've been exposed to. I know there's like Burt Coyote. Uh, there's oh, a that's bunch the of Luminox, Luminox. The, the original lighted knock, and so, you have to pull the whole knock out to turn it off okay instead of the cylinder of the knock like this where you pull it out and turn it off but well, what are you selling change. the most i don't have a um, nocturnal is probably what i sell the most of and there's an internal cylinder and a nocturnal that moves in and out so the knock stays fixed and there's a little central piece that moves yeah. in and out 
but they also have the fit system which this also does to where you can take one package of knocks and it fits like 90 percent of the arrows oh they do so you don't need seven different sizes of because that's what knock these guys have the same yeah deal. they have a fit system which is great um but the other thing that nocturnal does offer that most of the other ones don't is a strobing lock uh yeah. have you shot an animal with the strobing one yet yeah how was that oh my god it's like four times brighter okay. i mean it's it's the same brightness but because it's turning on and off so at such a rapid rate it's, just, it's it's flashing between two different colors really fast. Oh, cool! So it's it's pretty obnoxious in a low light situation yeah. that it's so blatantly obvious as it goes. It's it, it you pick it up, I'd say, twenty to thirty percent quicker in flight because it's like screaming at you. Which one goes. of these is the lightest? Uh, the true nocturnal is actually the lightest one I weighed, which is the other reason I really like nocturnal. Um, when you weigh them all out it has the least amount of extra guard. Now I know Luminox I think are pretty light too because it's just a knock with a little sleeve. When you start adding the different, the ability to pull the knock in and out, you have a little more hardware involved. Okay. Which is why those are a little heavier. Well, the last thing we're gonna do on this video for you guys is we're gonna establish my front and center on my setup. We'll just do the math real quick and we'll tell you what that is. And just kind of a nice little overview. I didn't want to get into the front end because it's so like, personal mm -hmm. but if you guys are wondering why i have this on here the reason why i like this broadhead in particular is i have used it a lot on animals i like the chisel tip um and i like the fact that when you take this off even though it's all four blades mm -hmm. it doesn't come apart yeah it's you know, always nice the washer's off but the blades are still in there yeah. Whereas if other brands, I've seen them fall apart in your quiver while you're hunting. Yeah, and that's the worry on ones that do that is if you're, everything vibrates when you fire your bow and if your broadhead starts to unscrew a little bit, if your blades are actually just held in by the arrow, yeah. you can pull a blade out a lot easier. Um, Thunderhead was one of the ones that were really common to do that way yeah. like 80s, 90s. Um, and you would commonly shoot an animal and you'd find your broadhead with two blades. Oh. So you, it pulled out on one at one point. And they were using gaskets to tighten it up, yep. so it was naturally like it wanted to unscrew pretty easily. Would you say that most broadheads are probably multiple pieces put in a ferrule? Or, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I only yeah. know a few that so, are actually like injected and. In yeah, molded. anything with a anything with a chisel point, you know, is pretty much all that type of broadhead. If it's a direct blade to the front, you got a better chance of it being one piece or not removable. Um, but anything where the blades come out, it, the blade retention system is pretty important. Should we talk about single bevel, double bevel real quick? Oh, you can. A single bevel grind is where one side of the broadhead is sharpened and the other side is not. Yep. And what that does is creates less force. So if you've ever used like a, a knife, which most a lot of people haven't or to my knowledge. Yeah. Um, we've ever cut with it. It feels really weird because it wants to go one way. When you go cut through something, your hand like takes off to the right or takes off to the left based off of which way it's the blades cut. But what you'll notice as you're cutting is it cuts way easier. Because when you grind both edges like that, it forces you to travel a straight line. Well, when you're doing that, you're creating resistance. Yes. So when you have a single bevel ground head, it wants to go to, to the through. same direction. Yep. And then when all blades are cut the same way, it just wants to turn that way as it goes Ooh. through something. So it's a, it's a pretty substantial increase in penetration mm. because there's just that much less resistance on the cut. Cool. All right, guys, if you have more questions, Post them in the bottom. We'll do more videos like this. This is Josh Jones. He's like my archery guru. He's my Yoda. And uh, he's your guys as well. So post below and thanks for watching. We'll catch you on the next one. All right, so let's see here. So our simple calculator wants our total arrow length. So we're gonna go 27 and a quarter is our total arrow length. Pump that in there, 27.25. And our knock to balance point. So we gotta find where this arrow wants to balance. Okay. Gotta draw on your arrow here. It's great. Then go from the knock to where that little mark is, and that looks like it's a tiny bit over 17. So I'm gonna give it like 17.1. 17.1. Calculate. 12.75% FOC is what you've got right now. Close to the sweet spot, but close. Uh, that's that's good. I mean, if you're gonna run a really heavy arrow, see that's the other negative about running a heavy arrow is you're adding grain weights all over, so it's harder to make the grain weight that you put in the front be a higher percentage. So when you get up to that like 11%, it takes a lot more up here to make that heavier, which is part of why I like a lighter grain per inch arrow because I end up with a higher FOC, Let's which tends to this. track better. Humor in me. Same mm -hmm. numbers, 
let's pretend I put that full brass insert in the 75 up front what would that get us it's like taking five off of the back um, 25 in the front's probably another half Okay, Somewhere so that gets you 13. That'll get you into the 13s. So that put me but, over 500 you know, for, greens. For a great example, for fun, does that come out? That should. Come out. Yeah, it should pop want, right out. doesn't seem to want to. I think you got a little wrap on there or something. <clears throat> no, That's good then. That one ain't coming out. Yeah, um, well. If you take a, if you put like a regular knock in there or eliminate the wrap, once yeah. again, you're adding a quarter or a half a percent to the front. So if you put like a regular knock in there, take the wrap off that arrow, leave everything else the same, it's probably close to a point higher in FOC, okay, which, is, which is why I don't like doing it because it adds so much to the back. It's so much harder to offset the front weight. Would I have to change my sight tape if I went from 20 grain lighted knock to an eight grain? Yeah, oh yeah, 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 100%. Yeah. But the other thing that you could do is go to a slightly lighter overall GPI arrow and leave everything else the same. No, thanks. <laughs> All right. 